In the mid-90s, the backstage group known as The Click became one of the most powerful factions in all of professional wrestling, regularly holding court with Vince McMahon and exerting influence over the booking of the World Wrestling Federation. However, their grip on life in the Federation loosened at least slightly by the middle of 1996. That's because three of the five Click members all ended up in WCW. Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Sean Waltman each playing a key part of the hottest storyline wrestling had seen in many years. With all three men leaving New York for Atlanta, WCW truly was where the big boys played as advertised. Less than two years later, however, at a time when WWF began closing the gap on their competitor, controversial circumstances led to one of those three men exiting WCW, and they quickly found themselves back at the gates of Titan. Thirty years ago, Sean Waltman was an indispensable commodity for those in the tape trading world. A ballsy daredevil that took to the sky with regularity, Waltman cultivated a wider following for himself while wrestling as the Lightning Kid. Matches with the likes of Jerry Lynn, Sabu, and others put Waltman on the map as he built an impressive resume throughout various American indies as well as Japan. And in the spring of 1993, the WWF came calling. For younger fans that have grown accustomed to seeing junior heavyweights occupy premium spots on modern WWE cards, understand that before 1993, wrestlers built like Waltman with his rail-thin torso and rangy limbs were never more than enhancement talents in the muscle-bound federation. Add in the fact that 20-year-old Waltman looked like a high school student, and it was hard to imagine the Lightning Kid making much of a dent in this land of giants. But these were changing times for some pretty obvious reasons, and the WWF wasn't so gung-ho about bigger bodies anymore. Waltman's athletic prowess was enough of a ticket to the dance. In fact, Waltman looked the part of the role he was brought in to play. Initially cast as a gutsy prelim with no hope of conquering his larger foes, Waltman lost a few matches on Monday Night Raw before stunning Razor Ramon in the veritable upset of the year. It was one of Raw's early watershed moments, a genuine shock to anybody watching as Waltman caught a dazed Ramon with a ceiling-scraping moonsault, earning the stunning 1-2-3. And that victory begat Waltman's new handle, the 1-2-3 Kid. Over the next three years, Waltman enthralled crowds with frenetic movement, fearless risks, and cringe-inducing splats. Matches with Bret Hart, Owen Hart, Hakushi, and his fellow Click members rate among the stronger bouts of the new generation era. Behind the scenes, Waltman fell in with the members of the Click, but by all accounts, he got along with virtually everybody on the roster, regardless of their political allegiance. Around the time both Hall and Nash finished up with the WWF, Waltman followed them out the door, albeit with far less fanfare. As the outsiders landed on the doorstep of WCW, Waltman bided his time before he joined them in their crusade. That September, Waltman debuted in WCW as the latest member of the New World Order, under the name Six. While some believe that this was because he was the sixth member of the NWO, Waltman was actually the seventh member of the group, following both Outsiders, Hollywood Hogan, Ted DiBiase, The Giant, and NWO Sting. The name Six actually derives from the sum of the three numbers in One, Two, Three, Kid. For the next year or so, Six proved quite prolific in an ever-expanding group. He unsuccessfully challenged Eddie Guerrero in a United States title ladder match at NWO Sold Out, before dethroning cruiserweight champion Dean Malenko at Super Brawl the following month. Later in 1997, Six sort of became co-holder to the tag team titles held by the Outsiders, as a stand-in for Nash who was sidelined with injury. 
Six was also victorious in a War Games match over the Four Horsemen as part of an NWO squad captained by Nash. On screen, Six was closely associated with Click Brothers Hall and Nash, just as he was off camera, and that connection led to Sean Waltman, in part, winding up as collateral damage in a battle that he wasn't even fighting. By the summer of 1997, Bischoff was already displeased with Waltman for using coarse language during a recent TV match, but he became even more annoyed with the wrestler on the night of the July 28th Nitro. While running interference during a match pitting NWO allies Buff Bagwell and Scott Norton against Ric Flair and Kurt Hennig, Six yanked down the back of Flair's trunks. The partial exposure infuriated Bischoff, who immediately fired Waltman for the act. Waltman was then immediately rehired when Diamond Dallas Page ambled over to Bischoff and reminded him that he had a match with Six later on that night. <sighs> Only in wrestling. Six wouldn't be doing much wrestling after mid-October, however. While working with Lex Luger at a house show in Duluth, Minnesota, Waltman sustained a significant neck injury, reported in the Wrestling Observer as a fractured vertebrae. Six actually did wrestle two more matches after sustaining the injury, though, including dropping Nash's half of the tag titles to the Steiner brothers on the October 13th Nitro. Waltman subsequently underwent neck surgery in November and was expected to be out of action for quite a while. Little did anyone realize that Six had already made his final appearance in WCW. On Monday, March 9th, 1998, while continuing to rehab from neck surgery at home, Sean Waltman was fired from World Championship Wrestling. Many felt that Waltman's firing was a warning shot to both Hall and Nash to put both men in their place. Both outsiders treaded deep on the political minefield that was World Championship Wrestling, and with other alpha headliners, particularly Hogan, vying for whatever control they could obtain, some wondered if Waltman's firing was a shot across the bow of Six's click buddies. As of late 2016, Waltman himself considered the possible Hall and Nash angle to his firing. While speaking one-on-one -on -one with Bischoff during a podcast appearance, he mentioned as such to the man who had made the decision to cut him loose. Bischoff denied that this was entirely the case, saying that as far as sending a message to the outsiders, if I wanted to do something to them, I would have done it to them. While Bischoff and the outsiders were indeed going through contentious times behind the scenes, Bischoff insists that the main impetus for Waltman being shown the door was another powerful figure. Barry Bloom may not be the most scorching hot name to the average wrestling viewer, and yet quite a few headline stars rate among his biggest fans. He's a super agent whose squared circle clientele is very impressive. After linking up with Jesse the Body Ventura in the 80s, Bloom eventually came to represent some of the industry's top names, including at different times Brock Lesnar, Triple H, Chris Jericho, Mick Foley, Bill Goldberg, Kenny Omega, and all three members of the Wolfpack, including Waltman. One person who was not a fan of Bloom's was Eric Bischoff. In recent years, Eazy -E has made it clear that he never wants to work with Bloom again, and the Waltman story illustrates his point of view. As Bischoff remembers it, somewhere around the turn of 1998, Waltman and WCW had agreed to terms on a new deal. While the precise terms of that deal aren't known, with Hall and Nash locked down with WCW into 2001, it seemed as though their kid brother was going to be with them for the long haul. According to Bischoff, WCW then began paying Waltman under those new contractual terms. Then, a couple of months into 1998, Bischoff says that he was informed by Diana Myers, a rep in his legal department, that Waltman had not actually signed the contract as of that time. Bischoff then says that he reached out to Bloom to get the deal properly taken care of, and at this point, Bischoff claims that Bloom attempted to renegotiate the value of Waltman's deal after Waltman had already started getting paid under the recently agreed upon terms. As Bischoff claimed in a 2009 interview with Wade Keller of Pro Wrestling Torch, 
Sean and I had an agreement. We reached an agreement. We had papered that agreement. We had been operating under that agreement for a substantial period of time where we were waiting to execute it. It's a normal process, or it was at the time. And then Barry Bloom decided at the last minute to try and up the ante and threaten to walk out and have Sean walk out. Bischoff called this a sleazy way to conduct business, though there would be much scrutiny over the move that he made next. In 1995, Eric Bischoff infamously fired Steve Austin over the phone, prompting much criticism over not doing so face to face. But at least the future Stone Cold got audible verbalization. On March 9th, while sitting at home, Waltman received a termination notice via FedEx. A courier dropped some documentation off at his house that informed Six that his services were no longer required by WCW. Understandably, Waltman was not happy with getting fired, but certainly he wasn't the only one that was upset about it. Before that evening's Nitro in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Hall and Nash reportedly confronted Bischoff over his decision to fire their friend. Both the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and Guy Evans' book Nitro claim that Bischoff told Nash that he would fix the situation. Nothing had changed come the Thunder taping in Baton Rouge three nights later, and this led to the Outsiders putting more heat on the boss. Per Waltman, Hall and Nash did this by trapping Bischoff in a broom closet at the arena. In the midst of the backstage heated row, Nash reportedly demanded his release from the company. Though not explicitly stated in these accounts, it's likely that Hall did as well. And in the death of WCW, it's claimed that Hall and Nash both tried to quit the company only to be reminded by Bischoff that they couldn't appear elsewhere until their deals lapsed in 2001. On the March 16th Nitro in Panama City, Hall and Nash showed up, as Evans Nitro describes it, halfway into an all-day drinking session, and made rather pithy remarks in their show promo that night, including Hall mockingly letting on-screen rival the Giant know over the microphone on live TV when his cue was to do his run-in on them. To pacify Nash, WCW managed to put together a program between him and Hogan, which led to the rift that split the NWO into two factions. Waltman's firing was worked into the angle when Nash asked Hogan on the March 26th Thunder why Six no longer had a job. Hollywood responded by saying that Six just couldn't hang. This was because Waltman by now had agreed to return to the WWF. The Observer claimed that Waltman's deal included a downside of $300,000 to $350,000 a year, an increase from the quarter mil that he was reportedly earning in WCW. During the several-week lurch post-firing, there seemed to be an expectation that because of the heat and backstage acrimony, Waltman might be brought back into WCW. Waltman instead turned up on Roy's War on March 30th, the night after WrestleMania 14. And it was no low-key comeback either. With Shawn Michaels shelved indefinitely after WrestleMania due to his extensive back injuries, Triple H seized control of D-Generation X. Coming into Raw, the group was whittled down to just he and China, so fortifying the core was going to be a necessity. After Helmsley verbally wrote off Michaels, he reintroduced Waltman without formally naming him. The Albany crowd recognized the wild-maned, sunglass-wearing junior heavyweight as he emerged from beneath the Titantron, while Jim Ross plainly declared, Well, look who's back. With the mic in hand, Waltman got to work shooting on his former employer. He told Hogan off for his comments on Thunder and said that Bischoff had his head up Hogan's ass. When talking about the remodeling of DX, Waltman made allusions to the Outsiders legitimately wanting out of WCW, adding Kevin Nash and Scott Hall would be standing here with us if they weren't being held hostage by World Championship Wrestling, and that's a fact, Eric Bischoff. Bischoff soon went on the defensive. In an internet chat the day after, Bischoff said in part that he only brought Waltman into WCW as a courtesy to Hall and Nash to make them happy and keep them from becoming a headache behind the scenes. He then added, because of what I consider to be negative and disruptive behavior on their part, it was clear to me that there was nothing I could do to create a positive environment for them. It no longer made sense to carry one of their friends under contract. 
While the story of Bloom's alleged contractual holdup later became the front page of why Waltman was let go, in 1998, Bischoff was quicker to discuss his issues with the Outsiders and how they related to Waltman's firing. It's probably fair to say that all of the above played a part in Bischoff deciding to fire the man soon to be known as X-Pac. Bischoff was unhappy with multiple people close to Waltman as well as Waltman himself, and the neighboring situations grew toxic enough to where the WCW president made a scorched earth decision. But whatever the precise impetus was, Waltman's return to the WWF was symbolic of something. For the preceding few years, several notable WWF talents moved over to WCW, causing shockwaves. When Hogan and Randy Savage moved over in 1994, the promotional war may not have been as explicit, but those were industrial giants bringing name value to the long-running second-place promotion. In a Nitro world, the defection of Luger, the return of Medusa, the gate-crashing of Hall and Nash, and later Waltman, and eventually the arrival of Bret Hart, all indicated that WCW might be more desirable than a WWF that looked far different than it had in its glory years. To many, the Federation was old and busted, whereas WCW was the new hotness, and TV ratings throughout 96 and 97 reflected that. But of course, Waltman was not the first WCW wrestler to make the wartime move to the WWF. Steve Austin and Vader both did so as 1995 turned to 1996, but for as supremely talented as they were, neither man's debut was really viewed as the WWF getting one over on their competitor. Jeff Jarrett's 1997 return came equipped with a worky shooty promo regarding why he left WCW, but his blistering words didn't exactly swing the momentum any. And while Brian Pillman created a stir in his 96 debut, the momentum of the NWO drama on the other channel drew a greater audience than whatever the loose cannon had to say. But when Waltman was fired by Bischoff, the WWF had by then started picking up steam. Austin was the franchise player that led the pack, and Attitude was slowly becoming the fresh flavor of the industry. The WWF was becoming cool again, and a wildly successful WrestleMania, aided by Mike Tyson in a starring role, had the Federation rapidly gaining on the still-hot WCW. Waltman's firing and subsequent return came at about the right time for the WWF. Eyes were turning back to the product, and here was a high-profile ex-WCW talent that had something venomous to say about Hogan and Bischoff, as well as his friends that he felt Bischoff was holding to ransom. Sean Waltman was the first WWF acquisition in the Monday Night Wars that really felt like WWF's gain was truly WCW's loss. As was written in The Death of WCW, to fans watching at home, it appeared that a big WCW star had suddenly decided that the WWF was really the place to be. After years of watching WCW win with ex-WWF stars in prime spots, the WWF was happy to prominently feature X-Pac as part of the remastered DX. He would return to WCW before long, with some camouflage and a Jeep, but that's a story for another day. Today, Bischoff and Waltman are on positive terms, and have many good things to say about each other. Bischoff regrets the frigid manner in which he fired Waltman, but justifies his right to do so, given the circumstances. As far as the firing went, Bischoff admits, I really didn't think it through. I was so hot, I was so pissed off, and I was mainly pissed off at Barry more than Sean. And while fences have been mended between the two iconic NWO members, the story remains a fascinating look at the decisions that get made amid heated circumstances in the world of professional wrestling, and how quickly a rival promotion is willing to take advantage of a competitor's fractious state of affairs. <laughs>